There we go. And then we, we're going to preach a braille today, so. And that's that. That's, that's good, though. I've got a wrong book here. I need a phone book. I've got to call somebody today. How y'all doing today? Pretty good? All right, I'm going to start off with a little joke today. I've already said this one before, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and start it off. So uh, there's a... There's a man, he, he comes in, he calls his church, and he, and he says, I would like to speak to the head hog at the trough. And uh, the lady who answered, she said, if you were referring to our pastor, we, uh, we refer to him as pastor or sir. We do not refer to him as the head hog at the trough. He says, well, man, I would like to make a $20,000 donation. He says, well, hold up, Porky's coming in about right now. <laughs> So that's about as funny as I'm going to get today. I hope you like that. I like that one. I might have said it before, but uh, I, love, I really like that one. Um, I want to talk today. Well, first, let's pray. Can we pray? Father God, Lord, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the sun and the shining, and, and for those of us on our motorcycles, it's great riding weather, except for that little spot of oil on the road on the golf links. Not so good. Lord, I think you're just trying to wake me up. Uh, Lord, I, but I do thank you for this weather, and I thank you for Calvary Baptist Church, and I thank you for the, the state convention. I, I thank you for just everything that you are doing in our lives, and, and Lord, the movement that you are making in North America. I believe that this is going to be an amazing year. For the rest of this year and next year, it's going to be amazing. I, I, I believe that there's going to be great things happening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Is this a little too loud? Or is it just me? I feel like I'm getting some ringing in my ears. It's probably because I don't have much going on up here, so it's just bouncing around. Um, I want to talk today about it not being too late. Sometimes we feel like we've made so many mistakes in our life that it's just too late for us. Or maybe the, we're, we're older, we're not 18 anymore, so it may be too late, and that God isn't going to use us. But God really is going to use us. Uh, excuse me, I'm really thirsty. Uh, Adam stole my water earlier. No, he didn't. But we get we get caught up in thinking that it's just too late for us. That there's nothing we can really do with our lives anymore. I'm a, I'm coming up on 50, and I believe that in even 20 years from now, God's still gonna be able to use me in new ways than what He's using me in today. And, and tomorrow's going to be a whole different thing than what he's doing today. I do believe that uh, every one of us can be used by God. It doesn't matter if we are two years old, like little Annie back there. We're four, almost four, like my son. If we're 18, like her. <laughs> or like Ginger, like she's 19 now, I believe, 18, 19 years old. She ran from us. She's hiding my glasses. These are readers, but this keeps falling off my ears, so it's the only one will keep it up there. So, so often we do, we get to the point where we feel stagnant and that we just, we can't be used anymore. Or maybe we feel like God's never going to use us. We've made such a wreck of our lives. And then maybe we just, and maybe we feel like, well, we didn't really make a wreck of it. We just never did anything magnificent. Well, we don't have to do anything magnificent because God did something magnificent. He created us. And he created us to impact the world. So this whole world was, was though it was created by God and for God, it was also created by God for us, for him. You see, we were created in his image, for his image. And it's something that maybe gets you on that a little bit, and maybe you're not catching that, and maybe by the end of this, you'll be able to understand it a little bit. And we're going to get into, uh, in chapter, uh, or in the book of uh, Mark, in chapter 5 today. And I'm going to dedicate this sermon. As a matter of fact, I'm going to dedicate every sermon I ever do Girls like this. This is a girl we buried Friday night, 19 years old. So, uh, because 
of drugs. So I'm going to dedicate this sermon to uh, her. I'm going to dedicate I'm going to preach next weekend up in, in Phoenix at a Southern Baptist church up there uh, called Corona, Corona Baptist. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with uh, Enchanted Hills Baptist here. Well, their old pastor, uh, uh, Mike uh, Molina, is the pastor up there. And he put together a big youth conference. And he said, Tracy, I want you to come up and I want you to talk to them. And I thought, well, God's going to use little Alex Warren right here to impact some, some kids up there. So well, if I cry a little bit during this, I cry a lot anyway. So that's not anything new. But I'm going to go up here and make sure this is turned off. Is this turned all the way down? So I'm going to double here because you don't even want to hear me once. I don't think you want to hear me twice. Sometimes. We get lost in our way on, on, on where we are going to reach for our help. And uh, right here, if you, if you open up this book right here, this is the phone book. You can get, man, you can get some great references. Yeah, I mean, you, if you need some help, if you're, if if your plumbing breaks, you can you can look in here and find Spartan Plumbing. If your car breaks down, you can find Borst Automotive. <laughs> you need a battery. Um, Man, if you, there, this book will give you a lot of help. If you got something broken, maybe you need, maybe you need a counselor. You can find that. Let's see, let's see what we can find in here. Marshall. Marshall, Marshall. Uh, so, so we're looking for some martial arts. There's American Institute of Kempo. I know LaToya, Broadway and Cole. 22nd in Harrison. It's got the phone numbers, talks a little bit about them. You need that if, uh, if you got problems with bees. You can call Truly Nolan or your teacher because there are more letters in the alphabet than just B. But so you can call <laughs> Truly Nolan, it has no information on them. It's even got coupons in here. So if you need some help in this world with things of this world, you can call here. You can open up this book and you can get lots of information. Both if you are heartbroken and you need someone to heal your heart, you can open up this book right here. If, if this book is here to help you. If you're the prodigal son of the trying to go home, if you are brokenhearted and you need to be lifted, if you are if you are just down on yourself and you need something to lift you up, there is a man you can call out on in here who is here for you. And his name's Jesus. And we're going to talk a little bit about Jesus today. But we're going to focus on a woman. And I'll tell you what. And, and most pastors won't admit to this. And I don't know, maybe I'm the only one who's ever done this. But I had a whole different sermon this morning and yesterday. And it wasn't until an hour ago, because the sermon I had was in the same scripture, but well, an hour and a half ago, we were having breakfast. I mean, the fellas... And the, and the young ladies were having breakfast this morning. And I said, well, I have to go home. I got to, I got to change. And I started reading the scripture that I was going to go over. And I thought, man, that sure is a lot. And I was going to talk about a young girl who was dying. And then another woman in the story came out. So... I'm going to give that a second. We'll drop the water again real quick. Jody, you go home. Give me buddy. Okay, go give me buddy. <laughs> We're getting started. And then I can remember. <laughs> We're not going to read all of this because it is a lot. I was going to read it all. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So Jesus it starts off in, in, the, in chapter 5 that uh, Jesus is traveling, he's going through a cemetery, he sees this crazy guy, naked, cutting himself up, he's just, he's the original cutter, he's sitting on a rock, he's just cutting himself and he's screaming, and Jesus comes to me, and, and, and he starts to speak truth to this man. And the man says, for I am legion, there are many of us. 
So this is a demon-possessed man. He's got many demons in him. He casts these demons out. They go into a pig, and he leaves. That was just like, I just kind of said this. You all know that story, right? If not, I'll, I'll, I'll do the whole story. We'll be here all day. But that's just, so then he leaves there. And he gets into his boat, and he starts to travel. And then when he gets across, gets across the, the lake, and, a, and a, a man by the name of Jarius comes to him, and he says, Jesus, my little girl is dying. I know you can help. See, she's 12 years old, and she's dying, and Jesus says, you know what, I can do this. I can do this. So he starts to head that way. And I'm going to try to paint you a picture of this as I'm reading it here, because that's what I was going to talk about, was that little girl. But instead, right in the middle of that story, another woman comes about, and a lot of you know this story, and I'm just hoping maybe you can grasp it, maybe seeing this is what I saw in it, but a woman comes to, uh, to him that has been dying for 12 years. And this little girl has been living for 12 years. So at the beginning of her life, before she started to die, another woman started to die. So the, the story goes, it says, Jesus went, went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. So I want you to picture this. So, so Jesus is is going through through this town and people are just crowding around and not so much trying to get a hold of him. They're just they're just it's just big crowds. And some are pushing up against them. And, and can you imagine that? The man that came to save the world is right beside you and you're and you're just kind of pushing him through. And it happens. Because that's happened to a lot of us. If you're like anything like me where you came to know Christ later in your life, then you were just pushing God away the whole time, even though he was right there. So it says in a uh, crowd, let me see. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd has suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She has suffered a great deal from many doctors. And over the years, she had spent everything she, you see, everything she had to pay for. She had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus. So she came up behind him, threw the crowd, and touched his robe. This woman, I want you to understand what the law says if you are bleeding. And it, this is, do you understand what I mean when I say she's been bleeding for 12 years? Yeah. This is the cycle. It usually lasts about a week. Women know it and fear it. <laughs> The law would say that if she came out, she was to, to yell over and over and over, unclean, unclean, unclean. She's saying that I am tainted. You shouldn't be around me. And if you touch me, you will now be unclean. And she's pressing. So there's this crowd around Jesus. And she says to herself, if I can only touch fringe of his, of his robe. I can be made clean. I can be healed. And Jesus is, is put, just going through and he's on his way to save a life. And this woman comes up and she needs her life saved. So she had heard about Jesus. She came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body she had been healed of her terrible condition. See, she's... Anybody here believe in, in mind control? Like, like, if you were happy thoughts, happy life, you know, I'm not saying name it and claim it by any means. I'm not saying... Oh, I believe somebody's going to give me a million dollars, so somebody's going to give me a million dollars, but I do believe that if I get up in the morning and I, and I shut my mind on, you know what, this person can't ruin my day, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to have a great day, 
No matter what's going on, I don't care if it's 120 degrees in the warehouse, I'm going to go in and I'm going to have a good day. Then I'm going to, at the end of the day, I'm going to leave and I'm going to have a pretty good day. At least I'm going to have a better day than what I had if I got up in the morning and I said, oh, poor me. I'm going to work. It's not going to be good. I'm going to have a hard time with this person and that person. And, and then, so are we, are we on like-minded here to believe in that in our mind that we can somewhat control the outcome of our, of our days? And the outcome of our lives with our mind. And I do, I believe that. I believe that when uh, the Bible says that your tongue is a double edged sword, you can use to be to break, uh, lift something up or break something down. That if you're speaking truth and goodness into your life, that you are going to have a, you're going to have more truth and goodness than if you weren't. So this woman, she said, if I can only touch the hem of his garments, I will be healed. She said it, she believed it, she touched it, and received it. There was no, there wasn't any, and I know that it wasn't like it was in her mind. She went, oh, I feel like I'm having a better day now. Did I lose? Did it turn off? Yeah. It did turn off. I'll go, I'll stay over here then. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, what I like about this one is I can stand all the way over here and it picks up. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this one off because, yeah, the battery's just about dead. There we go. It's right not picking up. So it wasn't like she was just believing it and thought that she had gotten better because she had gotten better. The bleeding stopped immediately and she felt better. Now, the feelings could have been. I just feel better. Or could have been, I'm not bleeding anymore. This rocks. So it says that. Whew. So Jesus realized, we'll go this back a little bit, the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched me? And he knew who touched me, or touched, who touched him. He, so he knew who touched him. It wasn't a big shock to him who touched him. It wasn't a big shock that she was going to touch him. He said this for other people to realize. You see, he could have just went on his way and said, OK, she's been healed. It's all good. I'm going to go on. But instead he said, who touched me? And then the, the disciples said, you know, they, they turned to him and said, his disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. She, I would imagine that she came and she fell at his knees. She says, I understand that I broke the law by not saying that I was unclean. But I also knew that if I did say that, they would keep you away from me. They would have protected you from me. And I needed you so desperately I needed you as much as that little girl needs you that you're on your way to see. And I can imagine the disciples were like, come on, Jesus, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. But instead he said, no, who touched me? He held up. He knew about the 12-year-old. The he had no problem. He's going to get to that 12-year-old. Because, see, Jesus was in the business of raising people from the dead, so it really didn't matter. It could have been two hours, it could have been two days, it could have been two weeks or two years. It doesn't matter because he is God Almighty. He raises people from the dead. He raised all of us from the dead. But we were once dead in our sin. We are now alive in Christ. So I know that it didn't really matter. It's like this, this little girl right here who, whose body is now dead in this world is now alive in Christ. As she sits on the lap of Jesus Christ right now and says to her mom, don't worry, I'm saving you a place. 
we got a spot for you, and it's beautiful here. So, what a beautiful little girl, man. Life cut short. So, um, when the disciples would say, come on, let's go, he said, no, I got a lesson to teach you here. And I'm going to use this as a moment. I'm going to teach you something. You're going to learn something about me today. He says, you can bring your filth. You can bring your disease. You can bring your uncleanliness. Because what I call clean, no one can call unclean. But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him. Oh, man, in the dirt, in the filth, with people crowding around. And when they saw her and the people around her, 12 years, she couldn't keep that a secret. The, I can imagine the horrifying look on the people that were around and the amazement that came when they saw that she was healed. Felt her knees in front of him and told him what it had done and he said to her, daughter. She looked for that day when he says, daughter, son. All yours. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, family, familia. He said to her daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. That's good news. Because where she thought, it was too late. She had spent every dime she had on doctors to get better. I said, yeah, you know, like this. Read this. Luke, Dr. Luke, he puts it a little more. He gets real, like, descriptive of it and puts it in medical terms. Everything about it, but I don't like Calvin Martin. But he's real kind of upfront about his uh, other girl's dirty. But God makes her clean. And I love that. Go in peace, your suffering is over. So while he was still speaking, and I'm going I'm to finish up this, this chapter because I think it's important. Okay. That while, while he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. Can you imagine this? His, his disciples that are walking with Jesus, they're telling, they're like, come on, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. This girl is gonna die. And you kind of wasted your time. This is, a, this is an older woman, man. She, uh, you know, she's been sick 12 years. She's gonna die anyways. Now this little girl is dead. And Jesus, <laughs> I can imagine what's going on in his head right now. Because he's probably like, oh, yours. You've been with me this long? Hold up. <laughs> and so he is. It says, she is not dead. There is no use troubling the teacher. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped, stopped the crowd and wouldn't and let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, they saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, what's all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. Oh, man. Jarius is probably like, They told me she's dead. You say she's alive. Their servants, your God. I won't believe you. Because everything that I love. So it says, 
all this commotion. And, and it says, the child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him. But he got the last laugh. It doesn't say that, but that does like my translation. It says, but he made them all leave. He said, get out. And he took the girl's father and the mother into, and, and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Why do you think he took those disciples, not all his disciples? What was that? He got nothing to prove. And he, don't, he doesn't need this going on. He took the three that were really close to him. You see, he's, he goes on and he, he doesn't really, he's not trying to get the word out. The word will get out later. The word's going to get out on the cross. That's when the word's going to get out. So he, he takes these three in. No, I got lost. Last year. He says, the crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father into the room with the girl's wife. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha Kong, which means, little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And he told them to give her something to eat. If I was dead, I'd probably want something to eat too. I'd like, can I get some Taco Bell or something? Um, the key to that is it's not too late. It's, it's not too late until it's too late. We are, we are here to be on mission. Every, every time I've ever been in here, that's what I always talk about, right? I talk about we need to get out there. We need, we need to bring people to Christ. We need to invite people into the church. This is an amazing, amazing, amazing church. It hosts so many other churches. So lives get saved in this church every week. Every week. Are happening in this church, in this building. There's Bible studies going on. People are getting fed here. There's a food pantry. There's music. There's worship. You see, I put that two, two different ways. There's music and then there's worship. Because worship isn't in the music, so that's a form of bringing us to worship. The worship is what are we going to give of ourselves? That is what worship is. It is a lot of people think the worship's like, when you're raising holy hands and you're singing, and no, that's just, that's going to bring you to worship. Okay. Worship is what are you going to give up? Because see, Jesus, as man, worshipped God the Father, and he gave his life for us to him. What are we going to give up? Is it too late? Is there anybody in here who just feels like it's too late? I made so many mistakes. Has anybody here ever felt like that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this morning. Tomorrow. A week from now. I'll get at a point in my life again where I go... Maybe I'm just too much of a mess, and God will say, Talitha, come. Well, hopefully not Talitha, because I'm not a little girl. But, uh, but he'll say, come, rise. Mighty men of God, mighty women of God, rise. I love you. It is not too late. And it doesn't matter what you've gone through, what you're going through. God didn't send his son to die for something that was too late. Maybe you have felt like it was too late. Maybe you walked through this life and you thought it was too late. And you searched all through this book for help.
you've looked in here and you've even looked in hell. I bet there, I bet if you look under hell, you'll find something in here. It might say refer to the other book. <laughs> but hey, it should. It should only set this down here because if, if not, Ginger's going to throw it at me here in a little bit. And uh, she's got a pretty good aim. She's almost about 18, 19 years old, so she's strong, way stronger than I am. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you need to really understand that it's not too late. That maybe you've been dying for 12 years. Maybe you've been dying for 12 minutes. Maybe you feel like you're already dead because life has beat you up so badly. You feel like there's nothing left. But I tell you, in this book, there's a man who came to redeem. There's a man who's also God, and he loves you. If you've never made a decision to say, you know what, I don't want to be dead, and I want to live, and you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I hate saying accept. Accepted Jesus, like, like he's so little, it's like, well, I accept the consequences. No, if you haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you would like to, I ask you, if you put your hands up right now, I'm going to pray for you. If you've never made that decision, if you, if you don't know what would happen if you walked out this door right now and... Uh, and five guys and two girls ran you over on motorcycles. <laughs> what would happen? <laughs> I wouldn't run you over. It would be them. So that's why I said five. No. If, if, if you were to go out here and die today, not knowing, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Because there is no purgatory. If you're, if any of you were like me, you were raised in the, I was raised in a Catholic church, and I was told about purgatory. There is no purgatory. I read the book. You can't make up words and then have somebody, you know, that you want to call holy, enforce that word and say, well, it is now the word of God. That would, to do that would be the, the same as to say Islam's correct or, or the Mormons are correct because they make something up. You know what? I ain't got nothing against Islam. I ain't got nothing against the Mormons. I only have to see them while I'm here. <laughs> They're not going where I'm going. Unless they change their thoughts and their hearts. I don't want you to leave here without that opportunity to know Jesus. I want you to know Jesus probably better than I know Jesus. Better than the person next to you knows Jesus. Because there's something about that brand new relationship when you just are so eager to know Jesus. When I got ordained, a man by the name of Chase Delverde 